Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to the last exercise class in the semester. Thank you for being here. Um, so today, my plan is to talk about the following topics, uh, which will appear in the exercise sheet for this week, <clears throat> which I'll post a bit later today because I haven't, I still haven't finished typing and typing it in. So first, we'll talk about um, commuting observables. And uh, and see why when we are measuring commuting observables, we don't have any problems because they're jointly measurable. And so it doesn't matter in which order we measure them. Uh, and the statistics that, that uh, are yielded, they're the same anyway. Uh, then we'll go to the case of non-commuting observables and we'll see on the example um, that for non-commuting observables, there is a particular lower bound on the product of their uh, variances, which is called the uncertainty relation. Uh, then we'll talk a bit, a bit about weak measurements, again, um, in a context of, of now in a context of quantum channels and POVMs. And finally, we will go to discuss Krauss operators and uh, Steins Brink dilation and consider. Um, one example of um, of such an operation and find the Krauss operators for the channel. Okay, so this is quite a packed schedule. I hope that we managed to talk about everything. Uh, okay, so let us start with the commuting observables. So, Just to remind you, our two observables A and B, we say that they commute if their commutator is zero, or this is equivalent to saying that AB equals to BA. And the first step that we're, uh, we're gonna make in showing that uh, these two observables are jointly measurable is to, um, is to show uh, that there exists family as a projectors PA uh, and family of projectors PB prime uh, such that I can write the observables A and B in terms of these projectors. or as a, as a linear superposition of this projectus. So A is the sum over A alpha A by A, and B is sum over B, B to B by B prime. Um, such that all of these projectors by A by B prime commute. So this, this should hold for all indices, so A and B. So the proof of this, uh, I'll, I'll leave the formal proof to you, but I'll give you a hint. Um, so way back in one of the earlier exercises, uh, we have looked at the commuting, uh, commuting operators. And one thing we have concluded about commuting operators is that if two operators commute, then there exists a basis in which uh, these operators are um, diagonalizable or uh, block diagonalizable. So if a, b equals zero, then Uh, then A and B are simultaneously diagonalizable or block diagonalizable. And this should give you uh, the idea of, of which basis to choose in order to write out these projectors by A and by B prime. Uh, if you if you want to um, to revisit this this um, 
this property of commuting operators, you can also go to, to one of the early exercise sheets. I think the one where we discuss the permission operators. Okay, um, now the next step, having like intuitively outlined what, what these families of projectors are, the next step is to, um, to assume. So first we're gonna assume and next um, in the end of the exercise, um, we will see a way how to formally prove it. Uh, we will assume that there exists a family of projectors, which we call a poi C tilde, such that uh, for all indices A, B, there exists sets, subsets of indices of C, which we call uh, he A and he B, such that we can write the projectors pi A and pi B using this these family of indices. Sorry, using these subsets of indices. So we can write pi A as sum over subset of indices he A of the projectors pi C. And pi B, we can write as the sum of the projectors uh, pi C tilde with the indices C uh, going over the subset of indices pi B. So you can imagine if we have like, if the indices C range from one to 10, say, uh, for example, the subset high A can be you know, one, three, five, and high B can be one, four, seven. But the idea is here that uh, the this the family of projectors pi C tilde they it represents a sort of a fine graining of um, of the projectors pi A and pi B. Oh, sorry, this is pi B prime since just to be um, consistent with what I've written before. So these are these projectors. Uh, but basically, pi C tilde. Are, is a fine graining of this, of uh, both of these projectors. Uh, so for example, this can be seen as, um, uh, I, 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 have, I have a certain, I don't know, I have a table and I want to measure its length. And then I have two, two scales, one of, one of which is in meters and the other one is in feet. And one way to, Kind of bring these two scales to uh, to one joint scale is just to say oh meter is hundred centimeters and one feet is I don't remember how many but like n centimeters and in this case uh, centimeter or if you can you can take even a finer graining of millimeter is is sort of this fine graining which allows us to express both of the um, units of measure. And here it's the same, it's just that we, we use the formal language of projectors to, um, to describe this. Um, okay, then let us, uh, let us express what, what is the probability of measuring uh, A, outcome A and measuring outcome B, given the state um, row. So suppose that the initial state of the system is rho and rho is a density matrix and we now know how to deal with density matrices. Then the probability of measuring outcome A on a state rho per, our, um, per the Born rule is the trace of pi A Row. Um, so then to express it via the um, the projectors PC tilde, we just write out pi A in terms of these projectors. So we write this as trace of um, sum over C in high A, pi C tilde row. We can take the sum 
out of the uh, trace because um, trace has this distributive property. So we are left with sum over C in high A trace phi C tilde rho. And hence we and trace of phi C tilde rho is the probability of measuring uh, if we if we apply this family of projectors P C tilde, um, we get the outcome C. So basically we can write this as sum over C in high A probability of measuring C uh, given the state rho. Okay, um, in analogous way, we can also write the uh, probability of getting outcome B given the state rho. So the probability of obtaining outcome B given the state rho per definition is a trace of phi b prime rho. In the same way, we can expand the phi b prime in terms of our new family phi c tilde, where c is summed over subset hi b. So it's, it's phi c tilde rho. And again, we can take the sum out and interpret the trace of phi c tilde rho as the probability of getting outcome uh, c given the initial state rho. So what we get is sum over c in the subset high b, probability of getting outcome c given the state rho. Um, okay. Now, as a next step, so this is step three, we will consider different um, measurement scenarios. And we'll see that for all of these measurement scenarios, the, uh, the joint probability distribution of getting outcomes A and B would be the, the same. So the first joint, uh, joint measurement scenario is, so we have the system in a state row. Then we measure the observable A. We get the outcome small a, and then we measure the observable b, and where we get the outcome small b. And now the thing that we want to compute is the uh, joint probability distribution of getting outcomes a and b, given the that the system was initially in a state row. Um, let us first compute this in this joint measurement scenario, and then we'll proceed to the next measurement scenario where we basically exchange the order of measuring A and B. Um, so after we measure the, uh, the observable A, and we get the outcome small a, the post-measurement state at this point which we label as row A is the following. It's pi A row by A over the trace of uh, pi A row by A. So basically what happens after we measure um, the system being in a state um, sorry, um, we measure the system and ob obtain the outcome A. Um, what we do, we project the system into the corresponding uh, projector, using the corresponding projector. And then we also normalize the state. So we just make sure that uh, the condition for the density matrix, which is that the trace of the density matrix has to be one, is fulfilled. Um, Okay, so because, because of the trace property here, we can put pi A in front uh, because of the cyclic property of the trace that we cyclically can move 
uh, around the, the matrices. Um, and then we use the property of the projector, which is that pi a pi a uh, multiplied by pi a would be would give us pi a again. So basically, then our post measurement state would be pi a rho pi a over trace pi a rho. Uh, now the question that we are asking is what is the probability of measuring outcome B? Um, given that we have already measured this outcome A here. And now we can basically just compute the probability of um, us obtaining outcome B, given that we, given that the system before we measure um, the observable B here is in a state rho A. So now the probability that we'll be computing is crucially the prob it's the conditional probability. It's not yet the joint probability distribution. So it's probability of getting outcome B, given that uh, while measuring the observable A, we got outcome A. The initial state is rho. So this is just given to us by the usual one rule, which is the trace of pi B prime rho A. Because here we, we just perform a measurement, getting outcome B. Uh, and here the state is rho A. And so here we can just input our definition of, um, so our result of what rho A is. So pi B prime rho A, sorry, pi A rho pi A or trace by a rho. These, this we can, we can rewrite as trace by b prime by a rho by a over trace by a rho. Um, now in the, in the nominator, we will use the fact that pi b prime and pi a commute for all a and b's, which means that we can just exchange uh, their order. So basically here I'm using the property that pi b prime pi a equals to pi a pi b prime. So this is due to pi b prime pi a commuting. So hence here I get trace of pi a pi b prime rho pi a. The denominator stays the same. And here for this expression, I can use the cyclic property of the trace and transfer pi a here in front. Um, and then it together with, with the other pi a, it will just give us all pi a. So here I use the cyclic property and also the fact that pi a, pi a would give me again pi a, which is the property of the projector. So I get trace of pi a, pi b prime rho over trace pi a rho. Um, let us note now that the um, that what we have in the denominator is in fact um, just a probability of measuring A given the initial state of the system rho. So I can rewrite this as trace by A by B prime rho over the probability of measuring A given the state rho. Um, given this uh, conditional probability, we can, um, we can calculate the joint probability of measuring outcomes A and B given the state row. 
uh, this probability is given by the uh, bias rule. So the joint probability of measuring A and B given the state row is the conditional probability of measuring B given A uh, multiplied by the probability of measuring A alone given the state row. So we just um, we just input into this expression what we got earlier for this conditional probability, which is the trace of by A by B prime row over the probability of getting A given the state row multiplied by the probability of uh, getting A given the state row. And we end up with the trace of by A by B prime row. How do we rewrite this in terms of um, the uh, fine-grained family pi tilde c? So for this, we just input um, how pi a and pi b are expressed. So we get the trace of sum over c and high a pi c tilde sum over c prime and high b by c prime tilde rho. Um, we can take both sums out. And we are left with trace by c tilde by c prime tilde rho. Uh, and here we can use the fact that pi c Tilde is a family of projectors, and hence, um, two, uh, if, project, if, two, if we take two distinct uh, elements of this family of projectors, um, they would be orthogonal to each other, which basically means that um, if we write it formally, pi c tilde pi c prime tilde equals to delta c c prime. This is just the Kronecker symbol. Uh, by C tilde. So in case C is equal to C prime, we just get by C tilde again. If C is not equal to C prime, then um, we get a zero, which means that the sum here, so the double sum here, uh, it is summing over non-zero elements only in the case where C is equal to C prime, uh, which means that when, when we say that C is in subset high A and C prime is in subset high B, the only non-zero um, components in the sum are those which lie in the intersection of these two subsets. So we can just write it as a sum over C in the intersection of high A and high B. Uh, and here we have the trace of pi C tilde rho. And again, as before, the pi C tilde rho, uh, trace of it can be um, interpreted as a probability of measuring C, outcome C, given the uh, initial state of system rho. Okay, so our final conclusion is that the probability, the joint probability distribution of getting outcomes A and B given the initial state rho is this expression here. So this was again the case where um, we consider the following measurement scheme. We first measure, measure the observable A, then the observable B, and then carried out this computation. Um, now let us consider another um, measurement scheme, which would be, so we start again with the state row. We first measure the observable B, 
get outcome small b. Then we measure the observable a, getting the outcome small a. Um, and now we again want to compute the joint probability distribution of a and b given the initial state row. So here, analogously to the previous case, the post measurement state after having measured the outcome B um, would be row B, which is we first just um, projected using the corresponding, <clears throat> the projector which corresponds to the obtained outcome. So it's gonna be pi B row pi B, sorry, primes. Um, over the trace of this expression. So we just normalize. And analogously to our previous consideration, what we will get in the denominator is just the trace of pi b prime rho, which is interpreted as a probability of getting outcome b given the initial state row. And then again, we can now compute the probability of getting outcome A given that we have obtained the outcome B, which is the trace of pi A rho B. And I will not repeat the steps that I've, I've, uh, I've gone through before. Uh, but it's basically the same um, the same story as here, and we use exactly the same properties. What we will get in the end is in, in the denominator is exactly the same expression. So what we will get is trace pi b prime pi a rho over the probability of getting outcome B given the initial state row. Uh, now to calculate the joint distribution, we again use the bias rule. So we just get the probability of A given B multiplied by the probability of B alone. And we get again the same expression as before which can be rewritten in terms of uh, pi c tilde in the same way. So on these examples, we see that um, we consider two possible measurement schemes. And for the both schemes, the order in which um, in which we measure the observables B and A does not matter. So we, in the end, we get anyway the same uh, joint probability distribution, which can be written in terms of this fine, more fine-grained observable C. Um, one can also imagine another measurement uh, scheme where we would just measure the observable C, get outcome C, and then I just process um, the results classically. So for example, we can just uh, obtain the statistics for measuring um, C in, in a subset high A, in a subset high B, and uh, then in the calculate uh, the sum of the probabilities for the intersection of high A and high B, and we will get, um, again, the correct probability distribution for measuring observables A and B. Um, so this is, this is a pretty simple consideration um, which intuitively follows already from the fact that 
oh, I have two things that commute. What does commutation mean? It means that it doesn't matter in which we, in which order we multiply the operators. And from this, um, using this more formal framework, we can see that um, I indeed, when we measure a system, when we measure these observables on a system, it does not really matter which measurement scheme we, we use. And moreover, we can just take a more fine-grained observable C and um, infer the statistics for A and B for measuring that observable. Uh, one final question is how we, um, how we find this more fine-grained observable C. So how we define this um, set of projectors by C tilde. Um, one, way, one way to do so, also as a hint, uh, is to again consider that when we were constructing the projectors uh, pi A and pi B prime, we made sure that um, pi A and pi B prime commute for all A and Bs which means that pi a and pi b prime in their own um, turn can be, um, can be simultaneously diagonalizable. And hence from this, you can already infer um, like more, more fine grained um, description of, this, of these projectors. But generally whenever you see that's something is commuting, um, yeah, the first property that you have to think about um, is that, oh, these two operators must be simultaneously diagonalizable or block diagonalizable. Okay, I'll move on to the next topic uh, since we don't have that much time. Um, and the next topic is the uncertainty relations. So here, for the commuting observables, we've seen that um, it doesn't matter in which order we, which measurement scheme we, or we apply, um, we anyway always get the same statistic, which is great. However, um, what happens in a case where the observables don't commute? So in a case when the observables don't commute, we arrive to so-called uncertainty relations. So suppose that A and B don't commute, uh, then it leads to the following observation that if we take the variances of A and B, um, of measuring A and the variance of measuring B, um, it can be lower bounded by the following one half of modulus of expected value of their commutator. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, the variances of A and B you can also take them like this, but it doesn't matter. So the variance of A is defined as the square root of expected value of A squared minus expected value of A squared. And the variance of B analogously um, modulus, sorry, the expected value of B squared minus the expected value of B squared. Uh, one consequence of this relation is uh, these uncertainty relation for uh, momentum and position, uh, which probably um, all of you know about. So basically it means that we cannot uh, simultaneously more, um, measure momentum and position um, with, with, uh, with uh, infinite precision. So there's always going to be uh, some mistake, uh, some error, which and the error is given exactly by this relation. Um, yeah, sorry, this is all, of course, uh, calculated given the sum initial state row. 
Um, okay, so we'll first just see an example of how this uh, relation comes to um, comes to play out. And for this, we'll just consider a qubit, which is in a state psi, um, which can be expressed as e to the power i phi cosine theta zero plus e to the power minus i phi sine theta one. So in in a vector form, this is just a vector e to the power i phi cosine theta, e to the power minus i phi sine theta. Um, okay. Uh, and the observables that we will consider are the observables x, y, and z. So these are the uh, Pauli matrices x, y, and z. So x is 0, 1, 1, 0. Z is 1, 0, 0, minus 1. And Y is 0, I minus I, 0. And crucially, none of these variables commute. In fact, um, like if you take their commutator, they will always give you uh, the uh, the remaining uh, the remaining operator. So I think, but with the i, but um, there might there might be a different sign here. But yeah, you can um, you can just calculate each of these commutators pairwise, and then see that it just yields um, with some coefficient uh, remaining operator. Uh, and now let us compute uh, the delta x, the variance of x, uh, the variance of y, and the just the average of z. And we will see that uh, indeed this uncertainty relation holds for um, the observables x and y, which are lower bounded by the coefficient by the expectation value of z. And, and because Z is the commutator uh, of X and Y. Okay, so let us just start calculating this. Um, so the expected value of X is Psi X Psi. So in the, in the matrix form, this would be uh, so first we have to conjugate this vector here and transpose it. So what we get is i to the power minus i phi cosine theta, i i phi sine theta, x, which is zero, one, one, zero, and then just the column vector. Okay, now we just multiply matrices. Um, so the result of the first multiplication of the first two is just the, um, uh, the line vector e to the power i phi sine theta, e to the power minus i phi cosine theta. So we just exchange these two entries. Um, which is multiplied by this column vector. Okay. So what we get now is e to the power two i phi um, sine theta cosine theta plus e to the power minus two i phi sine theta cosine theta. Let us massage this equation a bit. Um, so one thing we can see is 
we can take sine theta cosine theta out. And we are left with e to the power two i phi plus e to the power minus two i phi. And we get sine theta cosine theta. Um, and this expression is exactly two um, cosines two theta because, so for example, if we write cosine alpha, cosine alpha can be written in terms of complex exponentials as e to the power um, i alpha plus e to the power minus i alpha over two. So hence we can just write that this is two um, cosine two phi. Also, this expression, which is two sine theta cosine theta, is just um, sine of two theta. So we get sine two theta cosine two phi. Okay, so now we calculate the next thing, which is the expected uh, value of x squared. This is fairly easy because so this is psi x squared psi. Uh, but if we take the x squared, the x squared is identity. Moreover, um, like if you take any of these operators, x, y, z, um, their square gives the identity. So what we end up with is just the psi psi and it's normalized that so we're gonna get one. And then the delta x, which is the square root of uh, average of x squared minus average x squared would be equal to one minus sine squared two theta cosine squared two phi. Um, okay, now we do the same procedure, but for the operator y. So for y, the average of y would be psi, y, psi. Again, I write this out uh, in a matrix form. So I write the same line vector. Here I write the y. And here I write the same column vector. So I have e to the power minus i phi cosine theta, e to the power i phi sine theta. I write the operator y. And then I write the column vector e to the power i phi cosine theta, e to the power minus i phi sine theta. Um, Okay, again, simple multiplication. First multiply this line vector with this matrix. So what I get is minus i e to the power i phi sine theta plus i e to the power minus, sorry, without plus, it's just the next term. Uh, i e to the power minus i phi cosine theta multiplied by the column vector. Um, and here what we get is the following, we get minus i e to the power two i phi sinus theta cosine theta uh, plus i e to the power minus two i phi cosine theta sine theta. Um, I take out the cosine theta, sine theta, and I'm left with um, minus i e to the power i phi plus i e to the power minus two i phi. And this I can actually rewrite as two sine um, two phi. 
Why? For the same reason, because I can rewrite sine alpha as e to the power i alpha minus e to the power minus i alpha over ti. And from this, it follows that I can write this as cosine theta, sine theta by two sine two phi. And so I get again, sine two theta, sine two phi. Um, okay, so this is uh, the average of y. Then the average of y squared by the same logic as for the x. This is psi y squared. Psi y squared is identity. And so I'm just, I just end up with psi psi, which is normalized, so it's one. And hence the delta y, the variance, which is the square root of average of y squared minus the average of y squared would be square root of one minus sine squared two theta, sine squared two phi. Okay. Um, so now the final step, and then we can have a small break. So now let us consider delta x variance, delta y variance multiplied. And for, um, for simplicity, let us consider the, uh, the square of this expression. What is this? This is one minus sine squared two theta cosine squared two phi, one minus sine squared two theta, um, sine squared two phi. Okay, then this is one minus sine squared two theta cosine squared two phi minus sine squared two theta sine squared two phi minus sine to the fourth two theta uh, sine squared two phi cosine squared two phi. Sorry, the plus here. Okay. Um, so this term plus this term would give us just sine squared two theta because cosine squared two phi plus sine squared two phi would give us one. And then one minus sine squared two theta would give us cosine squared two theta. So basically this would be cosine squared two theta plus sine to the four two theta, sine squared two phi, cosine squared two phi. Um, okay, now let us compare this expression to uh, the commutator of x, y uh, average. So, the average of the commutator of x, y, let me maybe compute just for now the commutator of x, y. So the commutator of x, y would give us x, y minus y, x. This would be 0, 1, 1, 0, um, 0, i minus i, 0, minus 0, i minus i, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0. Okay, this would be, so the first multiplication would give us um, minus i, zero, zero, i minus um, i, zero, zero minus i. So basically it would give us, we can take out two i, give us minus one, zero, zero, one. So basically we get minus two i, 
one, zero, zero, minus one. So we get minus two i z. Uh, then the modulus, then the expression that we want to um, compare our, the, our product of variances to is the, as the one I mentioned here. So here we just want to confirm that this holds, given this example, is one half of the modulus of the average of this variance. Um, and this is basically the modulus kills i here. One half kills two here, and the modulus also kills minus. So basically, this is equal to the modulus of the average of z. So that's why I was also um, suggesting to calculate the average of z. And so the average of z is just psi z psi. So e to the power minus i phi cosine e to the power i phi sine z and the column vector. Um, okay, so here we get the first multiplication gives us this. And then we multiply it with a column vector. Uh, which basically gives us uh, cosine squared theta minus sine squared theta. which is basically um, cosine squared two theta. And now uh, we can trivially see that the, um, that indeed, if we take the, um, yeah, if we take this, um, this expression uh, and co compare it to uh, to this expression here, what we get is um, that this expression is larger or equal to this expression. So basically what we get is delta x delta y is bigger or equal than one half of modulus of x, y, average um, yeah because this term here is always bigger or equal than than zero okay so this was just an example of um, to show you that indeed this um, this uncertainty relation holds uh, in the exercise, you also need to prove uh, the um, the general uncertainty relation for two operators A and B, given the state row. So this can be done are uh, using the cauchy schwarz inequality analog for traces. And um, yeah, just writing this, um, this expression out in terms of the traces of A, B rho and so on. And hint, one hint I can give you, um, 
show that our delta a r squared equals to trace rho a minus average of a squared. And from this, uh, using the uh, cauchy schwarz inequality, basically this uncertainty relation follows. If you, uh, if you struggle with this, um, I'll probably upload the solutions at the same time I'll upload the exercise sheet. So um, you can just look up the solutions. Okay, um, now let us make um, a small break, let's say 10 minutes, and then we, um, we reunite at 20 posts. Okay, so let us continue. Um, so there was a question about delta A. Um, so delta A is the sigma squared and what we understand as sigma squared in the standard in the classical probability calculation. So it's a standard deviation. Um, yeah, it's just here we are calculated given the particular state. So. Then we take the average of A and average of A squared. Okay, so let us finish with this part and start with the next one, which concerns the weak measurement. And, but generally the part concerns quantum channels and um, how we describe quantum channels. But first, uh, one of the particular channels we'll look at is the channel that we can use uh, for a weak measurement. So in lecture, also in the exercise class, you've seen that um, the strong or projective measurement can be carried out as we have a system A, which is initially in the state A, and then we have the system that we will label as E, because we can also just refer to the environment, which is initially in the state zero, and we, uh, we perform a C node gate. Uh, and a C node gate, as we've seen, can, uh, can, um, corresponds to the coherent copy and also corresponds to this strong projective measurement. And as you've seen in the lecture, in fact, it can be described by two Krauss operators, which are zero, zero, and one, one. Um, with the respective probabilities. Um, so I will talk about cross operators a bit later in a moment. Now we would consider a different gate, which would make the measurement um, less strong, so to say. So would make a measurement weaker. So the coupling between two systems, A and E, would be weaker. Um, which is that instead of the controlled not gate, which is a controlled X gate, we perform a controlled rotation. So we can depict it as, again, we have two systems, A and E, and then we carry out a controlled gate, um, which is Rx of theta. So this corresponds to mapping row A to the state row A prime, which would be trace, tracing out the system E, unitary U, which is basically this controlled gate, um, which is applied to all uh, systems A and E in the state row A tensor product zero, zero E, or U dagger where the unitary U is this rotation gate um, and we write it as if the state, if the system A in the state zero, then we do nothing on the system E plus if the system A is in state one, then we perform this rotation gate. And the rotation gate 
is uh, the following. So it's identity cosine theta over two minus I X sine theta over two. So just, um, just to expand this for simplicity, we can write this in matrix notation. So we just, instead of identity and X, we input their matrix counterparts. And we end up with cosine theta over two um, minus I sine theta over two I minus I theta, sorry, minus I sinus theta over two cosine theta over two. Okay. And now I will explain how the exercise goes, uh, but you, know, you have to carry out the calculations by yourselves, but this is quite easy. What you have to do is just to write out this, um, this unitary U in the matrix form, apply it to the initial state, um, and uh, check out the trace. So basically, first thing that you have to do is, is calculate row A uh, E prime, which is the state after we applied the rotation gate. So it's U row A zero on E, U dagger. And then, Calculate row A prime, which is we trace out the environment out of row A E prime. Um, then, given this, the form of row A E prime, what you uh, you can describe this final channel. which maps rho a to rho a prime as function of theta. And for some theta, this channel would correspond to a strong measurement. So, um, and for some theta, it would correspond to weaker measurement. So basically you will need to find the ranges of theta for which this measurement is still strong. Then for, um, for particular values of theta, you need to find the POVM elements M0 and M1, which would correspond to measuring zero or measuring one. So this would mean that we would need to find the, um, the POVMs M0 and M1 such that measuring, sorry, uh, projecting a row prime into M0, which would be the same, the trace of it would be the same as just measuring zero, zero on the initial state. And the same for M1. Um, and then finally, you'll need to consider different rotation gates and what happens when we, uh, when we take diff uh, other rotation gates. So for example, in this rotation gate, this is an X rotation gate because we use the X, um, X operator here, but one can also use Y or Z operator instead. So you would need to consider what happens if we change X to Y or X to Z and how this map changes basically. But the general idea here is just to consider um, the, what happens on the system A when we perform this uh, controlled operation. And in the lecture, 
Uh, we already seen how to analyze these cases because there was a case with um, analyzing what happens to the system A when it's used as a control um, in a CNOT on the environment. Um, and which map, um, which map is basically induced by that. And we saw there that it's basically the map which only leaves the diagonal elements of the matrix. So it's the map which um, acts as a projector onto a zero, zero and one, one. And here we slightly change the C nodes uh, for the rotation. Uh, and we would need to see what, what changes in the concentration then. What is this map exactly? Uh, so this is one of the examples of the maps that we'll be looking at. And the other example of the map is the, um, is the map which would also weaken this full depolarization map that was considered in the lecture. But before that, uh, let me quickly recap uh, the Krauss um, operator representation and Steinspring dilation. So what is the Krauss representation? So given any uh, TPCPM channel and TPCPM uh, means that it's um, trace preserving, completely positive map, uh, which we work as epsilon, which maps from A to A prime. So basically it takes endomorphisms at, um, in the Helbert space HA uh, to the endomorphisms of the Hilbert space HA prime. And these endomorphisms, they're basically density matrices. So it takes density matrices in um, Hilbert space A to density matrices in Hilbert space H8 prime. Uh, and when we apply it to the um, density matrix row, then it can be re uh, it can be written as a decomposition uh, as the sum over k e k row e k dagger where EKs are exactly this Krauss operators. Um, where EK dagger EK sum over K um, has to be identity. Uh, this, this representation is useful because it basically decomposes the action of the channel into these small actions um, of, of this individual cross operators. And then we see what exactly happens um, within the channel. Uh, moreover, uh, one thing about this decomposition is that it's non-unique. So for, for the one channel, you can have several um, decompositions. Uh, what is more important is that given, uh, given this decomposition for a channel, it, uh, it gives us a way to, um, to describe the channel as um, unitary um, operation, but on a bigger system. So this um, going from, from describing a map as a, as a channel, to, uh, to describing a map as a smaller process happening in within a bigger process, which is a, which is a unitary, is called Steinspring dilation. So, Steinspring dilation is basically the following: it's when we express the action of the TPCPM map as first we have the action of isometry, which maps the system A to system to, to bigger joint system A prime E, where E is usually 
understood as the environment uh, acting on, yeah, this is on A, row A. Yeah, the same V dagger. And then we map the system A to a bigger system A prime E, but then we trace out this, the environment. And then we get the, um, the action of our map. So in the example that we've seen in the previous exercise with the wave measurement, we took an approach where we first considered the unitary and then we traced out one system and we got the channel, um, this TPCPM map. Uh, this can be, so it's kind of a top-down approach. Uh, and now we can do a down top approach saying that, oh, if I have a TPCPM map, actually uh, for any such map, there exists uh, kind of this system, this environment system E, uh, for which if I add this environment system, I can just describe this TPCPM map as tracing out this environment on the unitary process, which happens on this bigger system, uh, which is a physical way of thinking about it because in the end, in the postulates of quantum mechanics, we model evolution as evolution of a system as a unitary. And thinking about this process in this way uh, allows us to still keep that postulate. Uh, but as I said, the isometry that appears in this uh, in this, um, in this decomposition basically can be written using the, the Krauss operators that describe the channel. So this isometry is just sum over K, EK, the Krauss operator, tensor product K, E, where K E is just the basis for the environment, for the Hilbert space of the environment. Um, and indeed, one can show that this is the isometry. E, and if you plug this in into this expression, then you would uh, directly get uh, that the channel can be written as this decomposition. Um, of course, as I said, neither this decomposition nor this isometry are unique. So you can always, for example, take a bigger environment and trace it out over the bigger environment um, and so on. And in the lecture, you already seen the this channel, which, um, as I said, for the CNOT, where you where you trace out the controlled qubit and just leave the qubit on which the action is controlled, and then you get so-called full depolarization map. Uh, so full depolarization map. Would be the map that. Uh, maps any density matrix row A to just uh, its diagonal elements. So basically, if the density matrix row A, we write it as row 0, 0, row 0, 1, row 1, 0, row 1, 1. Then after applying this map, everything we're left with is row 0, 0 and row 1, 1. And the other ones are 0. We can imagine a weaker version of this map, where this process happens only with probability, uh, let's say one minus P. And with probability P, the matrix stays the same. So this other map then can be, ex can be um, expressed as we have the initial state row A, and then with probability P, the state is still row A, and with probability minus p, it ends up in this fully de de depolarized state. Uh, 
Um, now let us find cross operators for this for this channel. So let me start it on the other page. Now I rewrite. So our action of the map is p row a plus one minus p row zero 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 row one one. Uh, I will further rewrite this as, to be even more clear, P row A plus one minus P row zero, 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 plus one minus P zero, 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 row one, one. What is this matrix? Uh, this is just the mate, this is what we get if we just project our initial matrix into zero, zero. So if we, this is basically just reading out the, uh, this element of the matrix. Uh, analogously, this is the matrix that we get if we project our initial matrix into one, one. Okay. Um, and the first term, we basically don't do anything to the matrix. So this is just identity, row A, identity. And from this, we can see that uh, we can rewrite this whole um, expression as identity is square root of P row A, identity is square root of P plus square root of one minus P zero zero row A square root of one minus P zero zero plus square root of one minus P one one row A square root of one minus P one one. And thus we get our brass operators. So let us This is, uh, let, let us name this one E0, this one E1, and this one yeah, E2, let's say. <clears throat> and then indeed, we get our decomposition. So in this case, E2, E1, and uh, E0 are Hermitian. So um, E0 is equal to E0 dagger. So basically we can write this as um, E0 row, a is zero plus E1 row A E1 plus E2 row A E2. Yeah, I mean, we can add daggers just for to be uh, concise, but the daggers in this case are equal to the operator itself. Um, and indeed one can also show the normalization condition that the sum of E0 dagger E0 plus E1 dagger E1 plus E2 dagger E2 equals, um, so this would be one minus P zero zero plus one minus P one one plus P um, identity. The sum of first two would be one minus P plus identity because zero, zero plus one, one would give us the identity. So we would have one minus P identity plus P identity, which would give us the identity. So the normalization condition for the cross operators here would also be um, satisfied. Um, so we quite quite easily just, just considering this, um, how we write out this channel, we found out the Krauss representation. Um, now, in fact, this, uh, this representation is not unique. So in fact, one can uh, even reduce the number of Krauss operators and use only two instead of three. So I can write them out here and at home you can check that indeed uh, they fulfill. Uh, all conditions. 
So can also be expressed in terms of two cross operators. So E0 then would be one minus P over two square root identity. And E1 would be square root of P over two Z, where Z is just the usual Z operator. Just check at home. Okay, um, now how we do construct the unitary which corresponds to, um, to this map, given that we already found our Krauss uh, decomposition. So we have our uh, E0, E1, and E2. And we also have our uh, expression for how we express the isometry. So we have basically three different Krauss operators in this decomposition, if we use this decomposition, and which basically means that we need to have um, an environment which has three, at least three distinct states. So it means that we need to take the environment which is of q to it. And then you just assign the zero um, environment state to E0, then E1 to, um, to one and E2 to two. And then you get your um, isometry and then you write out the unitary. So for the unitary, you take the isometry. And in this case, A is just, A is um, isomorphic to A prime. Um, This would be sum over k, e k, k e, tensor product, um, where k e is one e, two e, and three e. So it's a q trend. So basically, what then you would do in the experiment, you would just take, um, you would take another system three three-dimensional um, system, you would perform a unitary on the system A and this environment system together, and then you would discard the environment system. This is how the um, this implementation would, would go. Um, okay, so, I think this is more or less everything that was in the exercise sheet. Um, I know that this is a lot. Uh, again, I'll post the solutions uh, at the same time I post the exercise sheet. Um, I don't know how, exactly how much of this will be in the exam. So for this, you have to ask Lydia. Um, but it's nice to know this general concept of, oh, I can take any uh, trace preserving completely positive map and I can make it a unitary on a bigger system. Um, yeah, so I think this is all I had to say for today. And if you have any questions, please shoot. Yeah, thank you for coming here. So Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year and yeah, you're welcome. If there are no questions, you're welcome to um, send me any by email or on Moodle. And there will be some question and answer sessions before the exam, of which we will inform you on Moodle. Thank you. Okay, bye.